This video is brought to you by OKCoin Crypto Exchange, where you can buy, sell, and trade your favorite cryptocurrencies, and you don't have to pay high fees. OKCoin has very low fees, lower than many of the other crypto exchanges in the market. You can also stake your cryptocurrencies and keep 100% of the rewards. There are no fees. Other exchanges charge fees. OKCoin allows you to keep 100% of the rewards. Sign up with OKCoin, link in the description. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel, your home for crypto news and interviews. With me today is Mike Belshi, who's the co-founder and CEO of BitGo. Some of Mike's accolades also include co-inventor of the SPDY protocol, which evolved into HTTP 2.0 creating the world's first multi-sig web wallet for Bitcoin, co-founding and pioneering email search via Lookout software, which was sold to Microsoft in 2004. And in addition, you were, Mike, one of the first engineers uh, on the, or 10 engineers at the Google Chrome team. Uh, it's, it's an honor to have you on the show. Well, thank you. Um, you got my bio down better than I think I could get it. So <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to bring you along. <laughs> Uh, Mike, I, I, I'm always fascinated as a techie, someone who loves the internet and technology by uh, folks such as yourself who were part of the early days of the internet building, and now you find yourself in crypto. And I, I inter I've interviewed some of your colleagues. I want to touch on that, but uh, maybe you can give us your background. You know, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Sure. So um, I'm a California native. Um, there's a lot of a lot of folks have come into this to this great state. Um, it's fantastic. We've got tremendous diversity here. Um, but uh, but I've been here my whole life. Actually, I never strayed very far, to be honest. Been in California pretty much my whole my whole life. Um, I got interested in computers at a very young age. Um, so uh, let's see. My first computer was an Atari 800, wow. um, which you may or may not know. Um, we had a cassette drive, which is fun. Um, and I used to type in computer programs out of Compute Magazine. Uh, they would have basic programs that they published every month. Um, to this day, my nemesis is still a Frogger clone that never quite worked. But okay. <laughs> anyway, there were a number that did work. Um, and I started, you know, I guess when I was uh, probably late elementary school, um, middle school was uh, doing programming on my own in a very terrible way. Um, but uh, coming into high school and then college, getting some actual training in computer science, um, suddenly it just like all clicked. So um, I'm very fortunate to have just enjoyed computers at, at a young age and um, then made a career of it. Um, and then again, fortunate to emerge into the professional career at a time when the internet is just getting created. Um, through a, uh, a friend of my father's, I'd been given access to um, uh, basically ARPANET, actually, which was a precursor to the internet, and got onto Usenet and things like that. Through there, I was in bulletin boards and that early era. But, you know, coming into my career, um, you know, the internet was just starting. Uh, so I started at HP, uh, did a, a nice stint there for a couple of years, but then was even more fortunate to get into Netscape just before it went public, um, which was an eye-opening and tremendous experience. Um, got to work with a, a, a bunch of fantastic people, um, but also just see innovation in Silicon Valley really starting to erupt. And um, there had been you know, the hardware boom in Silicon Valley, which, which predated me, but then the software boom, I think, was really kind of kicked off, you know, with the Netscape IPO. Um, it was shocking to my parents that I would go to this, you know, unheard of company called Netscape, um, but uh, they later forgave me, um, I, I guess. So anyway, I've been lucky to be in, in a number of startups, um, doing a bunch of exciting things, um, started a couple of my own, had the good fortune of landing at uh, Google just as Chrome was emerging. Uh, that was fantastic because I had this long interest in, in networking um, and, you know, got to work on what became HTTP 2.0. As you mentioned, um, there's only two companies in the world that could have really worked on protocols like that. It was Microsoft and it was Google. Microsoft at that time was sort of into the internet, but also having a, 
internal uh, fight. Is it going to be, you know, thick apps? Is it going to be uh, web apps? Um, but, but Google allowed us to, to, to play with that in a very fun way. Um, there's no money in protocols, by the way. Right. Um, until you got tokens, I guess, with crypto. Um, now there's money in protocols. Right. Um, when I was doing protocols, there was no money in protocols. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, I'm very lucky to have had, had a, uh, a fantastic time where, where things are evolving in ways that, you know, certainly the previous generation would not have imagined. Now, um, as mentioned, I interviewed two of your colleagues at Netscape, Brendan Ike, Bill Barheit. Is it, it, can you tell me about working with them and, you know, Bill Barheit called you guys the Netscape mafia because you're now in crypto. And, and what is that, what is that like? You know, such a long period of time and now you're in this new technology, this new emerging asset class. Well, you know, I think, when you work at a successful company, um, it grows and a lot of people are there and a lot of great minds are there and that's what made it a great company. So, you know, Brendan and Bill, um, both fantastic people. Um, and it's, it's actually a delight to kind of run into them again, kind of now in the crypto era. Um, you know, Brendan went on a long career, you know, through Firefox, Mozilla, um, and, you know, eventually landed here in crypto and working on Brave, still in the browser space, I suppose, can't get away from it. Um, but Brendan, for those that don't know, is the, you know, the creator of JavaScript, um, for which he's, um, he's famous and probably either most proud or least proud, I'm not sure. Um, but, I mean, he is one of the smartest technical minds you're, you're ever going to meet. Um, and if you had him on the show, you, you kind of know what I'm talking about. You're just trying to keep up. And about the end of the show, you realize you probably missed half of the amazing things that he said. Um, and, uh, and Bill, you know, he's gone on to do Abra. Um, also super smart guy, um, a lot of financial background over there. Um, so a different type of, uh, of uh, financial genius or, or um, tech slash crypto genius. Um, so anyway, um, exciting to be in common space with these guys. Um, humbling for sure. And, and not to mention Mark Andreessen, of course, and, and A16Z now taking a very large position in crypto. Um, did you, do you still keep in contact with these folks? I, I know everybody has their lives. They're all working, building companies. Is there ever a Netscape reunion type thing? You know, there was a Netscape reunion a few years ago. I actually didn't go. Um, it was at, uh, at the Rosewood Hotel, you know, not, not too far from here. Um, uh, you know, Mark has had a tremendous career. I remember when he left Netscape and went on to be a venture capitalist, I really wondered, you know, how he was going to emerge in that. And wow, has he knocked it out of the park again? Um, so phenomenal there. Also, actually, I was a little closer to Ben Horowitz. Um, I wouldn't say that Ben and I were ever super close, but he was product manager on the uh, enterprise server, uh, which I was working on when I was way back in Netscape. So, um, you know, uh, I really, Bitco got into crypto before A16Z got into crypto. Um, I, I kind of am kicking myself. I did meet with Ben uh, once kind of, I think it was the crypto winter of um, like 2015, 2016. Uh, I went over and met with Ben uh, to, to look for some, uh, I don't know, staring into the abyss type of advice. Um, it was a rough few years in crypto. Um, and I don't remember the conversation a whole lot, but, you know, with a lot of things in small companies, it takes a lot of perseverance and grit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what was your first encounter with crypto? How, how did you come across it? And was it a transition from Google, you know, while you were at Google, you learned about crypto and then decided to start BitGo? How did that process happen? Yeah, actually, to be honest, I can't remember the first time I heard about Bitcoin. And at that, in those days, it was really Bitcoin, right? I mean, there, there were a bunch of forks and you know, things going on. There was Namecoin, there was Litecoin, et cetera, had, had started to emerge. But um, you know, Bitcoin was really it. Um, I think I was too dense uh, or uh, you know, too busy, I don't know, to really notice the first time I heard about it. But it was the type of thing where you hear about it the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time. Eventually, something triggered me to, to go really investigate. And the engineer in me uh, woke up and said, okay, 
this can't be for real. You know, let's go figure out how to break this thing. Let's go figure out how to, how to hack it or whatnot. Um, and I just started messing around. I hadn't really thought about, you know, some of the techniques in terms of the blockchain evolution, in terms of the, the hashing concepts that were behind it, the mining concepts were behind it. Next thing you know, I'm in, you know, downloading it, I'm compiling it, I'm, I'm messing around with the source code. And of course, I wasn't a good enough engineer to break it. I think it's a pretty solid <laughs> product uh, as evidenced by a now a 10 year history. Um, but, but that's what got me into it. It's just, it's a fascinating thing. And so many people have had this experience where, you know, there's the technology component, you know, how does that work? Then there's like the mining and the validators and the block rewards, how does that work? And then there's like the economics of it. And it starts to just bring you into a number of different disciplines that are fascinating. For me, I'd never really thought about the monetary side of things. I'd always been on the, the, the technology side of things. Um, so, you know, there's just so much to explore. And if you're intellectually curious, you'll have a great time in Bitcoin, kind of no matter when you get started. Um, and that's, that's what happened for me. So next thing you know, I'm, um, I'm working with my good friend, uh, Bill Lee at the time, um, and exploring ideas about what we could do in crypto. We're helping uh, friends and colleagues and, and uh, investors kind of get some of their first Bitcoin. There was a... Uh, an exchange called Trade Hill. You ever hear that one? No, I don't think it. Yeah, I haven't come across that name. It was based here in San Francisco, um, and uh, you know they they really had it locked up. Um, a guy named Jared Kenna was the CEO of that company, um, and they had all of the kind of high net worth individuals coming to buy there. They they were building a, uh, a dark pool as well as an exchange. And then kind of the regulation and money transmission questions started arising. And, you know, Coinbase was just getting started. Um, very small, kind of more on the retail side. Um, to be honest, I think Trade Hill could have won in a significant way. Um, they ended up, they, they got kind of their first, they got some sort of inquiry. And I, to be honest, I don't know what it was, but something um, about money transmission licenses or things like that. And they didn't want to go down there. And so they, they, they shut down. Mm. So I think they basically ceded it to Coinbase because I think uh, they were ahead. Wow. Anyway, it's a long story, but uh, helped some people buy Bitcoin, stored it. I was a technical guy. Um, and as that value grew and grew and grew, it started to get kind of scary, right? Like I didn't want to lose my friend's colleague's money. Um, I mean, I don't think they would have come after me in any sort of way, but um, I certainly wouldn't want to have my name associated with that. So that that's what led me to start investigating. How do you store it better? How do you secure this? Like, how do we prevent these hacks that we keep reading about? Uh, I don't know if you remember Bitcoinica, predecessor of uh, Bitfinex and others. There's just all these bad news things that happened. Mt. Gox happened back then. Um, I guess that was a little bit later. Um, but uh, that led me to find multisig. And uh, Nimbica was born out of that. Wow. Um, now I have to ask, and, and, and it's not specific to BitGo, but rather your personal portfolio of uh, cryptocurrencies. W what do you have in your portfolio? I'm assuming Bitcoin, any altcoins? <laughs> um, sure. Um, I, I have, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm the biggest fan of Bitcoin. Um, my, uh, my wife is smarter than I am. So she, uh, she got me into Ethereum early. Um, and like I said, she's smarter than me. Um, and then we have a, a few others, N not a lot. I, I'm not really a trader. I'm, I'm much more interested in running the business and helping the, the, the space grow. Uh, there's a lot of scams out there. There's a lot of junk out there. There's a lot of good stuff out there that's going to fail. You know, it's, it's kind of like I often make the analogy of uh, it's like programming languages. Hmm. Uh, you, you, you can't really predict easily which programming languages are going to become the most popular ones. Um, bad programming languages, we mentioned JavaScript, uh, <laughs> very popular language. And yet very few people would give it high marks for being like a really great um, consistent language. Um, other ones like Smalltalk, you know, I don't, you ever heard of Smalltalk, Tony? Yep. All right, good. So, you know, Generally, language experts um, tend, tend, tend to look pretty favorably on it. It's a very con concise, um, elegant language. Um, so 
just like programming languages, there's going to be a lot of coins that come. Some of them will have good technical merit, but there's an organic nature to, uh, to which assets actually fulfill utility, you know, combine that with good technical prowess and differentiation that make them successful in the market. Um, it's hard to predict. So I do have a few others, um, but not, not a lot. I'm not, not a big investor um, or trader. Now, the, the analogy that could be made, and, and, and you, which you probably know all too well, of the dot-com boom, There's a, there was the Googles, the Amazons, but then there was the pets.coms, and it's, it's similar to that, right? I mean, you're seeing this boom, a lot of innovation, but there's going to be a lot of failure, but there's going to be a, maybe a good core of winners, that come out of this. That's right. I, I mean, I, I totally agree. So, you know, some people are like, hey, Bitcoin is the one true coin and it's got a network effect and it's going to be the one that wins. Look, I think Bitcoin has has definitely hit a real use case around store value. It's got a network effect. It's going to be around for a very, very long time. What, what it had to prove, and the other coins haven't had to prove this the same way, is that, hey, you can take a billion dollars and you can put it into this coin and 10 years down the line, you're still going to have something that's worth about a billion dollars or, or maybe much more. Um, how do you prove to people with a brand new coin that it's worthy of large investments? And if you don't like the billion dollar number, pick the million dollar number, right? I mean, over time, the, the sizes have gone, gone up. And so Bitcoin proved that this is possible with a fantastic static monetary policy that we've never seen before. Now, innovation keeps going. Innovation never stops. Once you kind of open the floodgates to the idea of, hey, you can use a private key to start to prove ownership of an asset. They can have different use cases and throw smart contracts and all these things in. Of course, there's going to be more. Ethereum has proven that there's tremendous demand for smart contracts. Now, does it scale quite the way we want? Does it have all the decentralization properties we want? Maybe, maybe not. There's more work to be done. And guess what? Innovation is going to keep coming kind of, kind of down that route. So much like the internet boom, which you mentioned, where you have a lot of spaghetti flung at a wall and some of it sticks and some of it doesn't, we're definitely seeing that. We are a global uh, information system today. So you can start up a coin regardless of where you may live in the world, regardless of how many resources you have. A smart guy you know, operating with a single PC can kickstart a brand new blockchain. It's phenomenal. Yep. Um, so of course there's garbage with the good stuff and it's hard to sort out. Um, and we're not so good at that, but it will sort out just like the dot-com boom sorted out. And we see these cycles and the ones that prove real utility, real use cases win. And the ones that don't, they die. It's very Darwinian. Um, I think it's one of the fantastic things about Silicon Valley, you know, lots of ideas, the bad ones die. The people that went and worked on those bad ones, they're not dead. They're, they actually get eaten up into the new ones that hopefully will succeed and eventually do. Um, so yeah, it's going to be very much the same. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's of course uh, really great because it's the free market and, and that's what we want. And these great ideas to come, um, to come forth. Um, let's talk about BitGo. Um, you know, we talked a bit about the history and, and you uh, found in that. Uh, tell us about the services you provide, obviously custodial services, um, maybe do you support the majority of the coins out there, the assets under management, and are you primarily dealing with institutional clients and what type of institutional clients? So it's funny, you know, BitGo is known for custody. I, I, I think of us as a, a wallet technology platform first mm-hmm. and foremost. I mean, we, we pioneered the multi-sig, which is pretty much the gold standard of security today. Um, I know people talk about MPC and other technologies, but like if you really want to secure things, you use multi-sig, um, and there's there's no questions to, about it. Um, the the evolution of digital assets is that first, you know, we've got tech enthusiasts, we've got you know the, those that want the sovereign holding of their assets. They love you know the the two of three multi-sig. Bitco helps secure their asset, but they hold the keys, and we can disappear off the face of the earth. They still hold their money. So it's a fantastic innovation in that regard. However, as you start to try to move into you know, traditional markets and fiduciaries, if you're holding money on behalf of someone else, we've always held you to a higher bar. We don't want you to be ripping off the investors that, you know, that you're servicing. Um, 
So all of a sudden, the idea of a fiduciary holding the asset themselves directly with no controls, no oversight, eh, that doesn't work. All right, if we want digital assets to really be ubiquitous, we have to make it so that you can hold it as a business. That is, you can take in money and maybe you're receiving you know, invoices each month that are getting paid, like you're going to accumulate a lot of wealth. How are you going to manage that on your balance sheet? Um, if you're an investor or an RIA or you know, an advisor, how are you going to manage that money if you're in a fiduciary capacity? We need these people in so that we can completely connect the pipes around the globe so that everyone has access to digital assets 100%. Now, some people are going to choose to hold it themselves, which is fantastic. And, you know, multi-sig, I think, is still the best way to do that. Um, others are going to be fiduciary. So, so Bitco is now a custodian. We're regulated in South Dakota. We're regulated in New York. We're converting to the OCC, which is a federal charter. We're regulated outside the U.S. and Germany and Singapore. Um, so we're continuing to expand that so that more and more businesses individuals, et cetera, can access digital assets of Bitcoin. Um, yes, lastly, we, we are institutionally focused, but that's really kind of a selection bias, right? Like, you know, what do we do? We help people secure billions of dollars of asset. Um, so obviously for any security problem you have at hand, the way you would secure a hundred dollars is different from how you would secure $100,000 different from somebody to secure a million or a billion, right? Um, so we do kind of self-select into businesses and institutions that are holding large amounts of money. And so because of that, we've become known as a custodian. Right. But actually, I'd like to think that we're, we're actually much more of a wallet platform innovator. Um, we come out with a number of, of things over the years that have, have changed the landscape for crypto, uh, hopefully, the better, hopefully for the better. Um, and what type of demand are you seeing from institutional investors? Is it pensions, other exchanges, uh, hedge funds? Can you give us some insight on that? Sure. Um, you know, I've been, my, my opinion on this has been changing in particular over the last three, three, three to six months. Um, and some people uh, actually criticize that, that maybe I'm, I'm uh, being captious of my own clients. Um, that, that we have a BICO, um, but I'm, I'm really not. Uh, look, I think the institutions that are coming um, and they are coming and it's gonna continue and it's gonna grow um, are gonna be a few different types. The crypto industry has been what's growing the most. These are companies that are emerging that understand the risk profile, that are looking for credible partners to work with. Those that are gonna go down the regulatory path, those are gonna take the hard path and figure out how to keep the assets secure trade it straight out of cold storage, et cetera. And we hit heavy on those companies. You would call those crypto natives or the crypto um, types of firms. The traditional um, financial system, I think is, is struggling. Um, we're seeing more, you know, you're hearing about it all the time. I've been hearing about it for six, seven years now. Uh, I think it was 2016, you know, we first think to deal with, with CME. They're very serious. This is a CME group. They're a Sifmu, you know what Sifmu is? No, no. All right. So, strategically important financial municipal utility. Um, turns out the Department of the Treasury keeps a list of companies that are so strategically important to the U.S. economy that they are designated as Sifmus. All right. CME Group, as the largest commodities exchange in the U.S., is one of them. You know, they were interested in crypto. It's really hard for these large firms that have built businesses uh, in the financial services world to kind of cannibalize their existing business and move towards crypto. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them today has people working for them. That's like, we got to do this. This is the future we got to go. The problem is they've also got another guy in the same firm that's like, no, Bitcoin is wrapped poison squared. Uh, Bitcoin is worthless, Jamie Dimon. Um, down, down the line, right? Um, so they end up kind of in this spinning debate where on one hand, they've got a business that's worth billions today, has nothing to do with digital assets. Right. On the other hand, they kind of think maybe there's something new coming. Um, and then lastly, they've got internal just dilemma uh, about it. So, so who's coming? Uh, so who is coming? The crypto natives are coming. 
they're going to grow. They're going to get big. Uh, Coinbase is already a $50, $60 billion company. Uh, Galaxy is a $7.5 billion company growing very quickly. Um, you know, these firms are going to be the future of finance unless the incumbents want to change. And this is a challenge. I'm throwing the gauntlet down right here on your podcast. Like all these guys that are incumbents are currently stuck in the Silicon Valley innovators dilemma. They haven't seen it before because they've been on the financial services side. They've been protected by regulatory moats that have made it difficult to get into their business. And all of a sudden, they're faced with the same innovator's dilemma that made IBM fail, that made Microsoft, I shouldn't say fail, these companies didn't fail, but you know they certainly lost their, their throne, right? right. Um, so the same thing is happening in financial services as technology comes in. This is what technology does, it disrupts. And unfortunately for the leaders of these companies, it's very difficult to see like, how are they gonna succeed? Now, by the way, I don't wanna discourage anybody that works at these companies um, whether you're at an investment bank or a uh, traditional custodian or whatnot, there's a lot of work to be done. It can be done. I think figuring out how to avoid the innovator's dilemma is your problem space. And if you can figure it out, you are a world-class business leader. I think you have the opportunity. You can do it. And if you do it, do, do it, I think it's going to be great for the world because you're going to actually help transform the world into a, a more transparent, safer, faster, lower cost um, financial system than what we have today. Um, but it's hard. You have to overcome the innovator's dilemma that frankly has hit every major tech firm in the history of Silicon Valley. All right. So I don't know, I rambled a little bit there, but um, that's how I see things evolving right now. Yeah. I mean, no, no, that's, that's great. It's great to get this perspective. Oh, 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 oh I did leave off one thing. You, you, had, you mentioned pension funds. I want to talk about pension funds and endowments. Um, these guys are coming in. Um, so the reason they're coming in and it's happening right now is because they have an obligation to their retirees, to whoever they manage their wealth for, the, their generational wealth to, 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 to create a return. And you know the, the conventional wisdom of the 90s and the 2000s was, you know, hey, as you progress, you're going to split your portfolio. You're going to have a mix of equities and bonds, et cetera. And, you know, you're going to make that more conservative to preserve the wealth for a long time. Unfortunately, the models which they thought were going to work 20 and 30 years ago are now starting to show signs they're not going to work, right? Bonds are in the toilet. You can't get, a money, you can't get money off of cash. If you're in Europe, you're getting negative yields off of cash already. The U.S., is it going to be able to preserve a positive return of 0.01%? Maybe. Um, but all these guys are like, my obligation is to make sure I preserve this wealth. And yet the, the premise that I had, the invariant that I thought was true, that bonds would have a value, it isn't there. On top of that, the equities market, everyone knows it's going to crash. We just don't know when, Right. It's been way up and to the right because of money printing that we've never seen before. So when your model is broken, they're like, shoot, what am I going to do? The answer, they're going to go put some into Bitcoin. They're going to do it now. Actually, they already are doing it now. It's why the price is going up. Um, they'll, they'll do a 3 or 5% you know, position, which on some of these pension funds is massive, right? This is huge amounts of money compared to what's in crypto today. Um, they have to. They don't have a choice. Like it's literally have a bunch of retirees out on the street, unable to pay their bills or go figure this out, put some in crypto. The downside, you return 3% less. The upside, you saved a bunch of people from, retir from, from retirement failure. So it's happening, it's happening now. Um, those folks are definitely coming in. Um, what do you think would be a catalyst that would drive the Jamie Diamonds of the world, these incumbents who... Like you said, the dilemma of innovation and, and you know adapting to new technology versus maintaining the status quo, that would drive them. Would it be like these other financial products collapsing, um, like you're saying, bonds and equities and so forth? Then then it's like a mass mass rush to crypto. You know, I wish I were smart enough to be able to to give you a definitive answer to that question. Um, 
have you read The Innovator's Dilemma yourself? I have not. All right. So this is why I think folks in the financial services industry need to go read that book right now. Um, they haven't read it because it wasn't aimed towards their market, but it's aimed towards the technology market and the technology and financial services markets are colliding. So you need to understand kind of these patterns. Um, I don't think uh, Christensen, the author of the book, had a conclusion about how you avoid the innovator's dilemma. Um, and so I wish I were smart enough to say, this is what can happen for them to get over it. Um, but if I had to venture a guess, and these are probably wrong, I would say it's gonna take making some risky, brave calls that your firm hasn't had to do for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. um, I literally mean hundred years. <laughs> These institutions have been around for a long time. You know, the, the, the challenge when you have a multi-billion dollar business is two fronts. One, you've got multi-billions of revenue that you could lose if you screw it up. And number two, you've got multi-billions of costs that you could incur regulatory or otherwise if you screw it up. So, you know, you're in a really damned situation if you, you mess this thing up and it's difficult to make those decisions. That's why they move slower, which they should. They're taking risk-based approaches. They're moving more cautiously. They're trying to assess everything. But unfortunately, there has to be a call that's going to be made around when you're going to cannibalize your existing business, move towards the new business and make it work. So we'll see. I think what's going to happen for the most part in the, in the short to medium term, the ETFs and derivatives markets create venues where traditional finance can participate at least in the price, uh, uh, the price swings, the, um, the, uh, the upsides and downsides of crypto without having to actually touch the thing. Mm. That'll give them kind of a, a, uh, an appeasement for a little while they'll be able to tell their clients oh yeah we're in we give you access to the but in terms of really getting in like the more interesting parts and there's you know still time for that for everybody you know this is the DeFi markets coming in and replacing market makers wholesale lending markets wholesale like these things are going to get replaced by the way existing DeFi is not ready yet i'm not trying to say that but you can clearly see it coming um so anyway this is a transition that has to be made and it's going to be hard. And we'll see if any of the financial services companies are able to do what IBM could not do, what Microsoft could not do, um, what, uh, you know, I should list some more historic uh, crypto, I'm sorry, um, Silicon Valley names, but all right. <laughs> now, you mentioned DeFi. Um, I believe you guys are working on bringing DeFi to institutions. Can you uh, shed some light there? Sure. Well, I mean, uh, DeFi, I think, is one of the most fascinating, innovative sectors of crypto, um, and it's just getting started. Uh, right now, it's difficult. Um, it's got more questions around regulatory, like who am I? Who is my counterparty? How do I deal with that? More questions about risk, like, wait a minute, these smart contracts, how are they audited? There's been a number of failures, right? It's really early days. Um, credible players, who's actually participating in a smart, disciplined, risk assessing way, um, and who's not. So uh, institutions are having a hard time with that, but BitGo, what are we about? Like, again, back to that wallet technology platform layer. We wanna make it so that the Bitcoin, the, sorry, the BitGo wallets are fully plumbed and connected to whatever's coming down the pike in terms of innovation on DeFi. So, I mean, the current two things is you know, DeFi in terms of, you know, lending, borrowing, market making, insurance, um, and then also, you know, NFTs and things like that. So um, the MetaMask institutional announcement, we're happy to, to announce that um, there's more coming. We've got a, a pretty significant DeFi team at this point, um, making sure that BitGo wallets are fully immersed in that world. Wow. Um, and you mentioned MetaMask integration. Uh you said that that is coming. Is there an ETA on that? I think it's really soon. To be honest, I'm, I'm not sure the date. It's um, it's a relatively small lift from where we're at, but uh, next month or so. Wow, very cool. Um, so, silly question. Uh, this will be available to 
retail investors as well via MetaMask? Um, for sure. So, I mean, we focus on institutions. Um, you can go to Bitco, you can sign up and you have access to the Bitco wallets. Um, there's, I guess, not full support for every, every asset type, um, just on the retail front door. That's not really where we're focused. Um, we're focused on the institutions that have a slightly different need in terms of multi-user wallets and policy management and, you know, the insurance behind it and things like that. So, um, Mostly it's, it's the institutional side. Now, I want to talk about Bitcoin El Salvador and the fact that BitGo is supporting the wallets there. Um, I want to get your thoughts on Bitcoin's adoption as legal tender and if you think other countries will follow suit and then how BitGo is supporting on that front. Sure. So first off, what BitGo is doing, I mean, all focus needs to be on what El Salvador is doing and not what BitGo is doing. This was up, you know, straight up our alley. Uh, as our bread and butter it was a super easy integration for them to do. Um, to be honest, all the hard lift hard lifts were done outside of Bitco. Um, they chose Bitco because we we clearly scale. We do twenty plus percent of all Bitcoin transactions by value today. Um, you know, on the Ethereum network, it's also significant. Uh, we got forty billion dollars in, in custody and things like that. So they wanted to know they had a solid wallet provider that's always up. That's going to scale. They had a large number of wallets that they were provisioning in a short period of time. They went to some other folks and looked for, you know, how do we provision, you know, six million wallets in two weeks? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and so you know, Bitco's helped with that. But but all credit really belongs to El Salvador. Now the second part of your question, um, you know, what does it mean to accept Bitcoin as legal tender? Um, you know, I'm a little bit more freedom based i guess i uh, i don't want to associate as um libertarian per se but you know should bitcoin be legal tender um yes for a co country like el salvador accepting bitcoin uh ubiquitously is a very good thing requiring people to uh, accept it for payments is slightly different than requiring for legal tender. Um, and technically the law that they wrote was about payments. Um, now the president later came back as well as other members of the government and clarified, no, 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 we're not going to actually require you to accept this payment. But think about this, like, let's say you and I wanted to exchange uh, whatever it is, and you wanted to sell me your microphone and I was going to pay you in pencils, right? Um, should the government require that you accept my Bitcoin instead of my pencils? Um, I don't think so. Uh, legal tender, however, which I guess was actually your question anyway, um, is about what's accepted to service debt, which is if you had lent me money um, and then I go to repay that loan, a legal tender is what you must accept as a, uh, uh, a lender um, from me in terms of payment. Like I can't come back to you and say, hey, you know, here's my you know, hundred dollars that I borrowed, I'm giving it back to you. And you're like, no, 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 I want pencils. Um, you would have to accept whatever is legal tender. So uh, let's see, overall, I mean, what El Salvador is doing is they're recognizing that there's different types of currencies. The US dollar has been, you know, inflated incredibly, which decreases the value of the dollar to most people. The ad inflation has been done by injecting those dollars specifically into the US only. So all of these stimulus checks go into the US. But remember, El Salvador is tied to the US dollar since 2001, which means they're not getting any of that cash infusion. Instead, they're just receiving the other side of it, which is the inflation. Um, so they feel the full, the full brunt of that inflation. So for them to, to say, hey, look, Maybe we need to have another alternative, and they chose Bitcoin. I think it's a great alternative because it doesn't have the the future possibility of this type of inflation. Um, it's, uh, it's nothing short of historic. Um, so we will see what happens, but I think the history books are going to look very kindly on El Salvador in a year, five years, and 10 years. And do you think uh, game theory will play out where a lot of the other Latin American countries Look, even maybe some countries in Africa um, will, will look to do the same where there's currency issues. 
Um, what does your gut tell you that maybe, maybe this might be, there may be some other countries doing the same? You know, this gets into an economic question, which is also, you know, above my pay grade, but like, should governments have the ability to print money? Um, so if you have your own currency, you can print it. If you're tied to the U.S. dollar, you can't, right? So some countries like El Salvador, like Panama, have already decided to forego the ability to make their own currency. Hmm. And the leaders did this usually after bad monetary events within their country that had nothing to do with the U.S. dollar, nothing to do with Bitcoin. So the leaders in those countries decided the best way to provide future stability to their country was to make sure that future leaders would not have the ability to hyperinflate their currency and cause economic chaos again. So they tied it to the dollar because the dollar was stable. So if you've already forgone the ability to print money, because I'm not convinced that all money printing has to be bad. The problem is, is that humans left to their, our own devices, we eventually screw up and we overprint. You know, somebody bad gets in power and, and does something that we don't wish them to do. And it has a negative, negative effect on the people. Um, so the question of should governments have the monetary power to print a little bit of extra in hard times and then be a little bit more restrictive in lean times. Maybe, maybe um, the countries that might go to Bitcoin first, I think are the ones that already gave up the ability to print money. Um, so they no longer have that. They don't no longer have that issue. Their issue is, do I want the dollar, which is inflating or do I want Bitcoin, which is not. And that's a much easier decision than to say like, Hmm, maybe I should get rid of my own currency so that future generations can't print it. Um, so I think we're going to see more for sure. I think uh, there's a number of countries that have already made this decision. And um, I mean, you're hearing about it in the news, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to talk about the big news we heard um, not too long ago of Galaxy Digital acquiring BitGo and what I believe it was reported as the largest crypto acquisition, I believe at $1.2 billion. Um, how did that come about? And and how will BitGo operate moving forward? Will this still be business as usual or are there changes coming? So I've known the Galaxy team obviously for a few years now. I mean, they invested in BitGo back in 2018. Um, they've got a fantastic team that understands financial services super well. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always enjoyed working with them. You know, Novogratz himself, although he's a, he's a colorful guy, he is a genuinely good human being. Um, so couldn't really pick a better partner to, to team up with. Um, now, what's happening in, the, in the, the climate in crypto? I think the time is now. You know, the, the pandemic, the circumstances we have in the macro environment, it's a really good time to make crypto grow. And how do you do that? Well, we need a full team, a full set of services. Bitco and, and Galaxy super complementary. So Bitco hits the technology super hard. We hit the custody really hard. We hit the regulatory kind of at those levels in a really positive way. Above that, you want to manage your treasury. You want to have it responsibly held in a volatile environment. You want to have access to the derivatives markets. You want to have structured products. You want to have investments. Galaxy hits all of that. Galaxy has a large balance sheet. So you combine these two things together. And I think we've got a really compelling joint offering. Um, and, and the reason for it is because the time is now competitively. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I, I was pleasantly surprised. I think uh, certainly good. And, you know, the first thing I thought of, and, and <laughs> you may correct me on this, was uh, Galaxy Digital going for that Bitcoin ETF and, and in addition to other business reasons of the acquisition, but having a trusted custodian and a wallet service such as yourself. Now, I, I'm speculating here and you can say I'm wrong, but <laughs> that's the first thing that came to mind. Well, you know, ETFs are going to require multiple custodians. Um, we want this, you know, yeah. I mean, this is where like, you know, you said Bit goes a custodian and I said, well, we're really more a wallet technology provider. Look, I like, Having a regulated custodian is, is a means to an end, which is we want to make digital assets ubiquitous so that we can do the more interesting things. Once it is ubiquitous and the price gets more stable, payments can start to emerge in a much more interesting way than they can today. 
you know, a lot of people confuse the idea that payments are somehow stuck on technology, whether it's lightning that you're looking for or something else. I don't think so. Sure, we need more technology. I'm not saying that's not, not true. But the real inhibitor to Bitcoin being used as a, a currency is that, you know, it's a volatile asset. Like, it's not convenient to use. So it'll get there through ubiquitous distribution of Bitcoin digital assets. Um, so this is all about, all about that path. And then in terms of the ETF, we wouldn't want all of our Bitcoins held at one custodian. We want to distribute it. So we got to go build market structure. Um, and we're off doing that. So unlike, unlike the exchanges in, in the digital asset space, which have created these kind of vertical silos, you know, they want to be the broker for both the buyer and the seller. They want to be the custodian for the buyer and the seller. They want to be the exchange. They want to be the clearinghouse. They want to take on all functions. Those models ultimately always fail. Mm. Bernie Madoff. It will fail. There will be abuses. There will be hacks. We need some amount of market structure. Um, the market structure separates these pieces such that we have a little bit of checks and balances in the markets that we use. And this brings stability and safety to everybody. Now, do we need the existing market structure that we have in the equities world? Probably not. We can do better than that. I'm not saying we have to replicate everything that exists, but checks and balances, well, that's just smart, right? So um, anyway, we, we need that in our markets. Um, even though Galaxy is going to be building, uh, you know, along with partners uh, and an ETF, um, no, we're not going to custody all of it. And the, the great thing about where Galaxy and Bitco come together is we can now work with you at a number of different levels without competing with you. And this is the same philosophy that Bitco's always had. People said to me years ago, they're like, Mike, why are you selling your technology to Goldman Sachs? They're just going to use it to turn around and compete with you. I'm like, no, no, no. I want them to use our software. Like, I want it to be secure. I want it to be safe. I want the industry to grow. And, you know, if you want to use us at a technology level and then provide the custody component on your own, there's a whole bunch of custodians that do that today. We can offer cold storage hardware and software. We sell. People don't know that we sell all this very often. Wow. Yeah. It's out there. Um, uh, or if you want to use us as a sub-custodian. So maybe you're already a custodian. You don't want to touch the asset directly. You want to use us as a sub-custodian. We can do that too. Um, and that's because we sell all layers of the stack. Our goal is ubiquitous distribution of digital assets. And you know we will make our products align with that. Good news, Galaxy's are the same page. Um, they have a lot more trading capabilities and derivatives access. All of that becomes available too. Um, I know we're running up on time here. So I wanna ask you about US crypto regulations, uh, specifically the SEC, uh, Gary Genser, and obviously there's a big lawsuit against Ripple over XRP. What are your thoughts on the SEC, crypto regulations, and that lawsuit. Um, well, fortunately, we don't have another hour. Um, so <laughs> we don't have to go into all of that. Look, I mean, we shouldn't be surprised that regulators are needing a lot of information. They're needing a lot of education. They are in a tough spot, right? Uh, they get yelled at if anything fails. They don't get praised if anything goes well. Um, it's no doubt that uh, the combination of having to learn this whole asset class while not having a clear kind of upside to it. They're in the crosshairs a lot. The crypto community very much wants to see clarity, like what's legal, what's not legal. I think the SEC is going to get there. The CFTC is going to get there. Um, it's going to take a little bit more education and some time to get through it. Um, I think more interesting and complicated is maybe the political scene mm. where you know, some politici politicians always have different agendas, right? Um, they're pushing a political uh, or a social stance, potentially. They may not know anything about crypto, but they may see it as something that they can use to say, hey, look, this is how I'm going to go generate some revenue by taxing those guys to just made a bunch of Bitcoin money. I mean, these are short-sighted, narrow-minded things to do, um, and it confuses everybody, um, self-included, by the way. <laughs> Um, but I think those, those voices will go down. And here's why those voices are going to go down. The crypto community is highly technical. It is a generally young community. It's an up and coming voting community. Crypto is for the people. It is democratization of money. You hear that a lot. 
it really is the thing which allows people to be at the same level playing field as banks. Mm. And that, that idea, that concept, that freedom will win. And we saw it when there was just a little hint at like, maybe we're going to pass some legislation, which declares all crypto companies and individuals as brokers. And the crypto community came out screaming. Yeah. And the yeah. political community was like, what? I didn't know this community existed. And suddenly they're going to be listening. Um, and it's just, it's just a short hop away. Um, anyway, so the regulators have got a lot of trouble in terms of education and things like that. The politicians currently have a lot of agendas that will sort out as the crypto community gets stronger. Um, I guess one last thing I hope happens, but I think it's going to take more time. We have a lot of laws on the books that we applied to our legacy financial system. And these were created after people were cheated or robbed or scammed. You know, and we want to protect investors and we want to protect retail. And people agree with these concepts generally. But those were built on opaque systems run by people with no transparency. And the new systems we're building are transparent and they're fair and they're run by computers and algorithms. So once you've reviewed a set of code and you know that it doesn't have an ability to cheat behind your back, you don't have to keep checking on it every five minutes. Say, are you cheating now? Are you cheating now? Are you cheating now? Whereas the broker, you know, you look at him on Monday, he might be smiling and wearing a suit and he's a good guy, but the rest of the week he might be cheating everybody. So you got to constantly monitor him. All right. So the laws we created for the legacy system, because it was run by humans and because it was not transparent, may not apply at all to the future system. I'm not saying I don't want investor protections. I absolutely do want investor protections. There are clearly abuses. There's clearly money laundering things that can happen. We need to protect people from those things. But the way we protect it may not be this, the, the old legacy rules at all. Right. And some of these laws from 1930 something, whatever it may be, uh, to your point, just- Actually, here's a little history thing. I'll give you a question. Who was the first uh, chairman of the SEC? Wow. I have no clue. <laughs> um, uh, Joe Kennedy. So mm -hmm. JFK's father. And wow. why was he put into that role? So he was a fantastic investor. And, you know, prior to having SEC and regulations, you know, there were all kinds of abuses. Oh, you want to talk about a, a bunch of rich guys getting together and pumping and dumping? Joe Kennedy was there. So when they looked for who would know best, how to regulate markets to bring them to a more fair, more stable uh, system. They tapped him because they knew that he had been figuring out all the ways to abuse the system prior. So I'm not trying to, to, to diss him. That's not my point. You know, he ended up creating a whole bunch of, of things, but they tapped him specifically because he knew what vulnerabilities it had at the time. And of course, those investment acts and the advisors act uh, all the way back from 1940 are still, you know, they've been amended and they've been, uh, you know, modified, but um, they're still the, the primary tenets of the SEC today. All right, Mike, I want to wrap it up here uh, with some quick rapid fire questions, such as what's your favorite food? Uh, Chinese food. Of course, <laughs> but your wife would be upset if you said something else. That's not true, actually. If you want to, <laughs> if you want to take a second, I'll take Mexican food. Um, I'm born and raised here in California. Um, but, you know, the, the foods have got a little bit of spice to it. And I can't handle that much because, you know, my genetics is what it is. But I still like it. Uh, favorite musician or band? Um, Boston. Mm, good one. Uh, favorite movie? Matrix. The first one. Are, are you excited for part four? I didn't know it was coming. You know, two and three were, were, were so lackluster. Um, you know, really only number one. Um, was very much worth watching. <laughs> Can't go wrong with number one. Uh, hopefully number four is good. Uh, favorite book? Um, well, you know, I've been citing this one a lot. It's good for our industry. Um, I think it's a fantastic crossroads between um, technology and financial services. Uh, it's uh, Behind the Cloud uh, by Mark Benioff. Um, super easy read. Um, but it basically talks about how Salesforce uh, conquered Oracle um, in the CRM world um, and how does a little tiny underdog 
beat a big giant Goliath. So it's related to, we talked about already, The Innovator's Dilemma by, uh, by Christensen. Um, and uh, this, this is another good book. So I think if you're in this space, even if you come from the financial services side, two books to read that come from the tech side that I think can, can, can help digest what's coming as technology eats the financial services world, those two books are great. I have to get both of those. Um, and finally, when you're not at BitGo, what are you doing for a hobby is for fun? Um, well, unfortunately, my job has kind of, you know, consumed my entire world. So uh, I, I don't I don't get much fun anymore. I was up at 5 a.m. this morning. Uh, it's five o'clock now. I'm still working. Um, all right. So what do I do for fun? Uh, I get out to hike a little bit. I like running with my wife. Um, simple things time with kids oh mike uh i know crypto can do that to you you know have you <laughs> locked in almost 24 7 but uh you know mike just a pleasure chatting with you thank you so much and um you know i, I, I i'm looking forward to the new uh things that bitgo is going to roll out and all the great work you're doing so thank you so much congrats to you tony on this podcast um you're extremely persistent i see you out there you know just keep hitting it and you know, like a lot of startups, that's how you get things going. You just don't give up. Um, so anyway, I see that in you and uh, congrats on, on everything you've been doing. Thanks for having me.